Nowadays, the idea of marriage seems quite natural to most people. However, it has not always been so. During a long period in history, man had no concept of love and the institution of marriage. From the very birth of human history, around three million years BC, up until the end of the matrilineal society, around 5000 BC, the history of marriage can be traced through its successive stages, beginning with group marriage, through polygamy, and finally to the monogamy stage. Each stage of this evolution had its own development, traces of which could be found a mere three decades ago in China. Today, these traces are fading, and in some instances have all but disappeared. Feudalism ruled over China for thousands of years, and indeed its influence is still felt today. In Shang Si Sheng, the cradle of the Chinese nation, this feudalism can be witnessed in the marriage customs. The marriage is arranged by the parents and the matchmaker. Family reputation is important and is scrutinized carefully. Many formalities must also be observed. The bride's birth chart must first be obtained. It is then hung at a shrine in the groom's house for three days. If nothing evil happens within this time, the bride-to-be is considered fortunate. Mm. A fortune teller then confirms whether she will bring luck to the groom's family. This is known as matching. Once a bride price is agreed and is delivered to the bride's house by the groom's family, then the wedding day is set. On the eve of the wedding day, the dowry is delivered to the groom's house. There, every item is announced in the traditional manner. Any deviation could bring disgrace to the families. The day of the wedding and the groom's house is festooned with bright decorations. The bride is carefully groomed as she awaits the sedan chair. She looks forward to the big event with some trepidation, as she has yet to meet her future husband. Back in the days when there were still imperial court examinations, those who passed the exams would have a parade in the streets to let everyone know about the great event. And a wedding was also regarded as very important. No expense was spared to make it the most spectacular and memorable day of the bride and groom's lives. Throwing buns to the crowd is traditional in marriage ceremonies. Amongst other things, they are supposed to ward off toothache. Last, the bride arrives. The bridegroom leads the bride by a red silk rope, which symbolizes the husband's rights over the wife. She follows him along a red carpet. The bride clutches a vase and a mirror as she steps over first burning coals and then a saddle to protect her against evil. Usually, the bride's veil is lifted after the ceremony. But here, the bride uncovers her face before the ceremony starts. This is the moment of truth where the bride and groom first set eyes on each other. By now, it's too late for second thoughts. Of course, even an arranged marriage can turn out to be a successful and happy one. 
This young couple will have to trust to luck and to the good judgment of their parents. After the cup of wine, as custom dictates, the newlyweds walk around the four sides of their nuptial bed to pray for a large family. After the wedding banquet, friends and relatives will come and tease the young couple. The idea behind this is to provoke a physical contact between the two of them. These friends have decided to grab the bridegroom and put handfuls of grain inside his clothing. The bride is then encouraged to find the grain and take it out. By doing this, the husband and wife can become better acquainted and the ice is broken. Secular marriages are quite common. In fact, it's even possible for a man to marry a ghost. In the feudal era, some engagements were arranged before a child's birth, others during early childhood. Life expectancy and the child's mortality rate often left one or the other future partner with no one to marry. In Fujian, a surviving male may remarry. However, he is still betrothed to the deceased, and he must marry her before he can marry her replacement. cases is replaced by a dummy. The ceremony remains the same. After the first wedding has been completed, the groom is free to marry again. The second bride must pay her respects by bowing to the dummy as the first bride's spirit has already entered the room. She is only a replacement for the first wife, and as such, she will look after the husband and bear children for her. On the first night of the honeymoon, the dummy is put on the bed. Beside her is a paper husband, so that she won't be jealous. The two couples spend the night in the same bed, the dummy watching over the newlyweds. These feudal practices are unfair when it comes to women who lose their betrothed before the wedding day. If the man dies, the woman must marry his ghost. But unlike a man, she is required to remain a widow for the rest of her life. formalities are gone through as usual, but in this case, a rooster represents the groom.
When the wedding is over, the bride is left alone with her husband's shrine in her room. She will remain in his family for the rest of her life, unable to remarry. This was considered to be virtuous of a woman back in the old days. This bride-to-be is weeping over her coming marriage. It's quite common in many places. In Hunan, the Tu Jia tribe is a typical example. According to custom, this girl started weeping 48 days before her wedding day. Her weeping is interspaced with singing. She is sad because her marriage will mean leaving her parents. As she sobs, she also curses the matchmaker for having found her a husband who will take her away. Her girlfriends join in the morning. They mourn the breakup of the family and the severing of domestic ties. They mourn the success of the matchmaker and the dressing of the bride and her farewell to her birthplace. In all, 11 mourning procedures must be followed. <laughs> The wedding day begins with the bride, still sobbing, taking her place in the sedan chair. She bids farewell to her lamenting family knowing that she will return in three days' time to a, hopefully, more happy atmosphere. She bids a last goodbye to her ancestor's shrine amidst the chorus of wails. The sedan chair is smeared with chicken blood. This is to prevent any bad luck being carried with her to the husband. Chopsticks are spilled before leaving to ask for a blessing on her parents' family. After that, the bride is not allowed to touch the family ground when getting into the sedan chair and must be carried on her brother's back. It's not that easy, as he must not touch his sister either. It requires a little imagination and some technique. to show that she is unwilling to leave her family. Changing her shoes signifies that she will never go back. Her girlfriends make the pretense of grabbing the sedan chair as it's leaving. It's very important to make a good show of this. Some scholars believe that this symbolizes the woman's resistance to the husband's rights. From 3 million BC to about 1 million BC, human society began to take shape. However, marriage as we know it didn't exist. 
This was the stage of group marriage, or what can be called primitive promiscuity. From 1 million BC to 100,000 BC, human society was splitting into different blood families. A form of promiscuity called consanguine group marriage is developed. In the matrilineal society, group marriage outside the tribe became common. However, there was nothing resembling the wedding ceremony as we know it, and these relationships were mainly casual. In the mountainous areas around Jinsha Jiang in Sichuan province, a small remote village still practices group marriage, but in a more progressive way. Not only do they have a wedding ceremony, but their marriages last. The people here belong to a branch of the Nai Si tribal minority. Within their rugged and spectacular environment, these people live a simple life, far from civilization. Many have never seen a car. This is a tribal wedding troupe. The man in the blue robe is the troupe's master of ceremonies. His official title is Minabu, which means the guide. The troupe arrives at the groom's house. Inside, someone is at prayer. The prayers are to prevent any bad spirits from the bride's family from entering. Both of these girls are brides, and they are both sisters. When the door is opened, the troupe proceeds inside for the ceremony. The man praying is called a Dongba, who acts as a kind of priest come official and who is considered very powerful by the villagers. Interestingly enough, there are no less than four grooms here, and they are all brothers. The tying of a cowhide rope is a very important part of the ceremony. It will ensure that the women will not run away. Actually, there doesn't seem to be much chance of that happening. Toasts are drunk to the happy event. The first toast is to the Minabu. Then the brothers drink to their future closeness. A toast to the brides follow. They are now husbands and wives. Each husband will have two wives and each wife has four husbands. <laughs> He'll drink to that. With six people living under one roof, accommodation is no simple matter. They must live in a three-story house. Husbands living on the top floor and other members of the family on the second floor, including the two wives. The wives are not allowed upstairs. When a husband feels romantic, he must go downstairs. This could cause a problem if all four husbands have the same idea at the same time. In these cases, it's a rule of first come, first served. Let's have a look at another family. This man is married to two wives. This is another example of group marriage. The girls are both sisters. And as they cannot handle heavy jobs, they regard their husband in part as a laborer. This one's very efficient in all departments. In the space of 10 years, the two sisters have given birth to 14 children. So this man is proven to be a good husband, as a large family means a big labor force. It's harvest time in the surrounding countryside. The procession of family members makes its way towards the fields.
It's a case of all hands on deck. A big family means less hired labor and more money. This family here on the contrary consists of two brothers sharing one wife. Their lands are on the other side of the mountain and the journey takes all day on foot. Usually, they leave their wife at home and spend most of their time farming and hunting in the woods nearby. It seems that game is very plentiful in this part of the country. The wife takes charge of all the housework and cooking. The staple diet is a mixture of corn flour. With wheat, they make a kind of wine which is drunk daily. Clothing is knitted from either wool or hemp, and each family makes do with articles that are homemade. Their only mode of transport is by foot, but the people seem content with their simple lifestyle. This woman spins thread as she goes about her daily routine. There is always work for her to do, and this will save time for more pressing chores. Group marriage is also referred to as synogamy, which means partnership. Its format and scope are not restricted and generally depend on economic circumstances, which makes it a very flexible arrangement. The Dong tribe were formerly a branch of the Yu tribal people. Their traditional costume, made from cowhide and egg whites, is quite unique. The combination of these materials gives the costume a sheen. The garment has no buttons and is weighted with pieces of silver. These people inhabit the regions of Guizhou, Guangxi, and Hunan provinces, living mainly off the land. Besides farming, they also operate freshwater fisheries. After a long day in the fields, there's nothing the local girls like better than a cool dip in the river. On some of the main routes to the village, intricate wooden bridges span the rivers. They're known as storm bridges because they are used as shelter during bad weather. These towering structures in the village are pagodas which are built in such a way that they resembled giant fir trees. The eaves overlap neatly. Inside, the roof towers above the onlooker. This fir trunk is used as a ladder. The ancestors of the Dong Yu people were a tribe that lived in the forest, and so these pagodas are built in the shape of a fir tree in remembrance of their ancient origins.
Each clan in the village has its own pagoda. Whenever a crisis arrives within the clan, members will gather here to discuss matters and resolve the problem. However, the pagoda also serves quite a different purpose. Young girls will often invite boys from outside the clan or village for a few hours singing, dancing, and conversation. The song they sing is called a step song for obvious reasons. The wedding of a Dong villager. The customs of the marriage ceremony have been handed down from the ancient tribe of their ancestors. It's a form of marriage by capture. When the groom's men approach, the bridesmaids help to hide the intended bride and defend her against the male horde with their umbrellas. This marital hide-and-seek is generally accompanied by a generous amount of good-natured horseplay between the sexes. However, umbrellas prove no match for the persistent young men, and the line of defense gradually collapses. The pursuers are gaining the upper hand as the girls fight a rear guard action to protect their friend. It's the end of the battle, and the bride a little out of breath, but none the worse for her ordeal, resigns herself to submission. A dull groom need not go to meet his bride. Instead, accompanied by her bridesmaids, she walks off to join her future husband. The Bao Yi tribe live in the southern part of Guizhou. All the houses in the village are made of stone, even down to the roof tiles. Here, young boys and girls marry at the age of 13 or 14. The girl remaining with her parents after the wedding, a custom known as non virai local residence. During this time, she continues to dress like a maiden sees her own friends, and carries on meeting other men freely. This period may last for up to a decade. This separation is an insult to a husband's rights, and he must take her back to restore his honor. This bride has been descended upon by her mother-in-law and sister-in-law. She struggles and breaks free as the two women give chase. Finally, the game is up, and the bride captured. The bride will have her hair combed out so that she no longer looks like a young girl. From then on, she is a woman and must assume her responsibilities as a wife. It's another form of marriage by capture. Three days later, the mother-in-law and sister-in-law bring along a rooster and some wine to the bride's house to collect her. She is given a change of clothes and required to dress like a married woman. A traditional hat is placed on her head. From now on, she is obliged to stay with her husband and renounce her flirting with other men.
At first sight, there might not seem to be anything unusual about these four people until you realize their relationship. The man on the left is the husband. On his left is his wife. On her left is her lover, and next to him is her lover's wife. This complicated relationship is quite common for these people. They are the Ao Yao tribe, and they live in Guangxi. The marriage customs here represent a transition between polygamy and monogamy. These people have a saying, a couple only eats together, but lovers sleep together. Marriage is seen as a means to increase productivity. Working together and taking a lover is regarded as being reasonable as well as being legal. This is the time for planting, and so the wife's lover brings along his wife to lend a hand in the fields. The husband, of course, is very grateful to them. A lover's date is usually initiated by the woman. With this secret signal, the lover will know exactly what to do. As darkness falls, the lover arrives bearing a torch as a sign that the meeting is quite open and honorable. The family hasn't quite finished eating dinner when the young man arrives, but the husband behaves normally and receives him as a distinguished guest since everything is above board. The lover feels honored. The young daughter's parentage may be in some doubt, but it's hardly important as both men treat her with equal kindness. <laughs> After supper comes entertainment. But first they gather to wash their feet together. This feet washing symbolizes their closeness as a family. When everything has been seen to, the wife and her lover are free to enjoy themselves. The husband is expected to leave them alone, so he lights his own torch and goes off to meet his own lover. This custom originated in matrilineal societies. At that time, men worked in their family and had love affairs outside. This continued until the advent of patrilineal societies and the establishment of monogamy. However, the custom survived in some areas with love, living, and sex becoming three different aspects of marriage. Love affairs in the Kashan Yao tribe are also quite open. If a girl invites a boy over at night, he can't use the front door. However, that's no problem for this resourceful Romeo. The post is there just for this purpose, and he climbs up to join his sweetheart. day, the girl will end the relationship if she decides she can't get along with her suitor. If she likes him, however, she will introduce him to her mother. In this particular case, the mother is delighted to find that her rather plain daughter has managed to catch herself a handsome young beau. She thanks him for coming and hopes to see him again. He is given a present and asked to stay a while. A marriage looks to be on the cards.
Their customs show matrilineal characteristics before marriage and patrilineal characteristics after marriage. It's the result of being in transition from one stage to the next. The Ainis in Sichuan Banna are a branch of the Hani people. Their village is unusual in that each house is surrounded by small cabins. The houses serve as the living quarters. Inside the house, however, men and women are strictly segregated and must stay in their respective corners of the house. Even eating and working are undertaken separately. Men with men and women with women. Even couples are not allowed to stay together. As you can imagine, this total separation is not conducive to the propagation of the species. So this is where the cabins come into play. Every male adult has his own cabin where he can date girls and indulge in his amorous pastimes. It's a characteristic of their patrilineal society. The Ainis hold the gourd in very high esteem. Its abundance of seeds symbolizes a big family, whilst its shape is similar to the male organ. These people have very defined standards of beauty. A girl should be plump with a small tummy. Their costume is therefore designed to show off their most important features. The skirt is just long enough to cover the bottom, and it sits low enough to enhance their beautiful figures. This group of young girls typifies the ideal beauty. But even beauties need a little makeup. Their adornments are extraordinary. Silver, ribbon, and lace are commonplace, although the girls often use nature's riches to enhance their looks. Strings of flower seeds are worn rather like a pearl necklace. Shells, which are highly sought after in the mountain areas, are made into a belt. Another piece of natural jewelry is this flying beetle. Before it can be used, it has to be prepared. The girls wrap it in a leaf, then dry it out thoroughly in the fire. It is then threaded with a piece of twine. The effect when put in the hair is quite beautiful. When an any girl reaches the age of 18, it's time to get married. But before any proposal can be made, a young man must know the girl's status. A yellow cap shows that the girl is 18 and is still single. A black hat means the girl is already married. A round hat means she's under 18 and can't get married yet, although she can have a social life. No. 
Anies are open in their attitudes and premarital sex is allowed. The young men and women often court through social activities, although it's not always easy as they must marry outside the tribe. Once married, affairs are tolerated within the rules. That is to say, men are allowed to have them, but women are not. <laughs> There's another way that young men and women become introduced. Young men from outside come in search of a girlfriend after first having obtained permission from the local villagers. Once a young man has selected his girl, he must make his intentions known to her. Three procedures must be followed. Firstly, the boy pulls her belt slightly. Then, he pats her on the shoulder. Finally, he grabs her from behind. If the girl resists, then the boy must leave her alone and try again with a different girl. This young man's wish has come true, and he's got his girl. To celebrate, the local boys treat him as an honored guest and give him a drink. In this case, it's not wine, just water. The lucky man is invited to stay the night, and a cabin is provided for the couple to spend the night in. When night falls, the village social life begins. Those looking for a mate assemble. At first, the boys keep their distance. But after a while, they become more at ease, and they get closer to the girls. When a decision is made, the young man must approach the girl of his choice. If he is refused, it's bad luck, and he must try again. If he's accepted, the couple will go off and get to know each other. The remote Ai Lao Shan Mountains in Hunan is the home of the Yiche. They are also a branch of the Hani people. The Yiche women's traditional costume is quite unusual. It is made up of a pair of shorts with the front opening blouse which leaves the right breast exposed. It's their everyday clothing and it's not considered indecent. All women want to look beautiful, but definitions of beauty vary from country to country. These girls have a natural beauty, something that no amount of makeup can provide. The Yiche have a special festival called Liang Hala, when young men look for a lover. The way they greet young girls is very unusual. Instead of shaking hands or even a kiss on the cheek, a man will press a girl's breast. Right side for old friends and left side for strangers. It's a great embarrassment if the wrong one is pressed, 
but the faux pas is quickly forgiven. When a boy meets a girl outside, he will often invite her to a party. The number of boys is always the same as the number of girls, and they sit alternately in a circle. They talk and flirt freely with either the person to their left or the person to their right. <laughs> At first, they are shy and feel a little awkward. But after some wine, the ice breaks and everybody feels at home. By the time the meal ends, everyone is in high spirits. <laughs> the Ichi are open in their sex life. However, despite this, an illegitimate child is frowned upon. This is not much of a problem, as all girls are betrothed at the age of four or five. They remain with their parents and don't live with their husbands until they are older and have given birth to a child. This shows that they are fertile. It's another example of a non-viral local residence. <laughs> A bridal party readies itself for the big event. The smartly dressed girls here are only the bridesmaids. This one is the bride. Before she leaves, her mother gives her a duck and an egg to carry, symbolizing her fecundity. This man is being beaten as he is leading the party taking the bride back home. It's part of the custom here. A rope is tied across the path of the husband's village. Everybody may cross over except the bride. She must break the rope to show that she is cutting off her links with her past. On arrival, the egg is put on the stove and the bride will share a bowl of uncooked rice with her new husband. From then on, they are married. <laughs> Most women in the tribal minorities are good at embroidery. This is especially true of the white trousered Yao. Like in many other tribes, they use it to convey love to the young men they admire. When they are in their teens, their parents build a cabin for them. They use this cabin for their love affairs. Ya, 
Contrary to what you may think, the long-haired youngsters playing here are all boys. The short-haired spectators are girls. Girls have their heads shaved from birth and remain bald until they start their social life. These novices still sport a short haircut. Most societies, the boy courts the girl, but here it's the opposite. To show her interest, a girl will pull the boy's belt. If the boy isn't interested, he will ignore her and walk away. If he is, he must still show a reluctance to take up the girl's offer. Otherwise, he is considered shameless and not a decent young man. If the girl wishes to take things further, she will take the boy home. Some boys prove to be more shy than others. Bringing a boy home is considered to be quite normal. In fact, the parents feel honored to have a suitor in the house. On the other hand, if no boy comes, the whole family is disgraced. <laughs> Though they are free in their sex life, the marriage is still subject to certain rules. If a girl wants to get married, her cousin must be given first refusal. Her father must consult her maternal uncle first, as her mother came from her uncle's family in the first place. It is thought only natural that the daughter should be offered in return. The offer is made in a roundabout way. The father asks, the vegetable on my farm is mature, would you like it? The uncle replies, it's good, but no thank you. This answer will make things easier. The girl is now free to marry the boy of her choice. Under an arrangement between the father and the uncle, two-thirds of the betrothal gifts will go to the uncle in recognition of his consent. Marrying a cousin is a form of intermarriage referred to by anthropologists as secondary blood tie marriage. This practice prevails in the Va tribe too. Although it is not allowed within a patrilineal family, nor within the same clan. It is even forbidden to marry someone with the same surname. If this code is violated, it is considered incest and regarded as an offense. As a punishment, the couple must buy a cow and slaughter it. The cow's head is cut off and put on top of the couple's heads to show repentance for this transgression. They treat the whole village to a share of the meat from the cow and pay for prayers to be said as they believe that this crime may enrage God. They fear that the clan or even the whole village may be cursed otherwise. Thereafter, the couple will never see each other again. The Va live in the mountainous region of Yunnan. The whole area is a veritable Shangri-La. They lead a simple and primitive lifestyle, and all labor is done by hand. The women 
usually work stripped to the waist. Bamboo is put to a wide range of uses for constructing houses, carrying water, drying the crops, and storing grain. The Va practice free love. Quite often, young men will go out at night to drop in on their girlfriends. Sometimes they will go in twos and threes or even in a large group. They spend the evening singing, dancing, and eventually sleeping together. Sleeping together is a sure way of having pleasant dreams, an important part of a good night's rest. The next morning, the youngsters tell each other about their dreams. If one dreams of trees or bamboo, it means good luck. A tree being pulled down or a man falling is a bad omen. In this way, they try to read each other's thoughts. If the couple get on well, the relationship will continue. If not, they can always break it off and blame it on the bad dreams. Matrilineal society flourished between 10,000 and 5,000 years BC. At first, people practiced group marriage, but slowly this evolved into polygamy. One example of polygamy is visiting marriage. This is practiced by the Moshu people of Yongning. This is a typical Moshu house. It shows the status of the Moshu woman. Women live upstairs, each having their own room. The rest of the house downstairs is occupied by the old folks and the young children. Adult males have no place in the home and are obliged to stay with their girlfriends at night. Those unlucky enough not to have girlfriends must rough it with the animals. An initiation ceremony is held when the Moshu boy is 13. After that, he's considered an adult and will join in with the work and enjoy all the privileges of adulthood, including having affairs. A specially close girlfriend is called a Nashao a name signifying that the boy and girl are sleeping together. Polygamy should not be confused with group marriage. The latter is between groups and is totally casual. The former is one to one, although there is still no formal bond and partners may come and go. Thank <laughs> you.
After the ceremony, this young Moshu boy will be an adult. He is ready to take his first ashao. If any of these boys and girls fall for each other, there will generally be a very quick response. At night, the young boy goes to the house of his new Ashao. He throws a pebble to attract the sleeping girl's attention. comes down and invites him upstairs. The next day, the boy returns to work in the fields as usual. If he fails to come back the next night, then the affair is over. Likewise, if the boy returns and the girl refuses to open the door, the affair is over. Children born from a visiting marriage are raised by their mothers. The father has no obligation to participate at all. However, men are not all without feelings, and after a while, he will lend a hand with the housework and the child. In the end, most couples will live together when they reach a certain age. The matrifocal family becomes a joint family, and the matrilineal family changes into a conjugal family. Visiting marriages have no rights, but for the Zhuans in Qinghai, it's quite different. A Lama blesses the girl first. This ceremony is for marriageable girls and is an ancient tradition for these people. Girls are free to select their mate. When it's time for the girl to change her clothes, she must wear two pearl necklaces at the back of her head to indicate the end of her maidenhood. Female relatives congregate around her. The most sacred moment is near. The closer they come, the lower the bride must hold her head. It's a religious ceremony called Dai Tian Tao, or marriage to the god. The holy water being sprinkled is in fact milk. During the prayers, the bride's face is washed with holy water.
The ceremony is about to begin. Strangely enough, there is no groom present at this wedding. Dai Tian Tao is a wedding for a single person who has no spouse to be. This girl is being married to God, represented here by the Lord Buddha. After the ceremony, the girl is free to have love affairs and to bring men home. All the villagers attend the ceremony and dance and sing to celebrate her wedding. The purpose of the ceremony is to announce to the public that another girl has reached womanhood and she is now able to take lovers. Now that she is married, she may indulge in the activity of Jiao Sang, having love affairs. It's a form of polygamy where the couple come together for a purely sexual relationship with no thought of family bonding. There is no right of exclusive access either. Each partner may come and go freely. This romantic period is a privilege of youth in an area where men far outnumber the women. It helps to correct the imbalance. Most of the older people have families. The Miao tribe are a larger minority. They regard themselves as descendants of Qi Yu and are scattered around the southwest mountainous areas of China. A hero's knot is considered the height of fashion. The Miao's are divided into several branches, and each branch has a different costume customs are different too. There are always festivals to celebrate. In some areas, there's a festival almost every month. And at these times, the Miao girls are especially busy. They dress up in traditional costume for the event. They don't get dressed at home but bring along their costume to the festival where their mothers dress them in public. Everything of value is worn. Silver ornaments show off their wealth, whilst the intricate dresses are a witness to their handiwork. A pierced ear with a large hole is considered prestigious and is meant to attract admirers. During these festivals, performers from surrounding villages will turn up to provide countless entertainment. Today is the 8th of April festival.
sent a gift to the mother of the dragon, for whom the festival is held as a welcome. Dragon boats at the annual Dragon Boat Festival. The Meow legend surrounding this festival is identical to Ham legend, except that they maintain Chiu Yun was a Meow. Hunan is the Meow place of origin, and there are indeed historical records of a Meow army, so their legend is not based on fantasy. The 6th of June festival is held to celebrate engagements. The atmosphere is completely different here. On this day, these young girls have decided to take a bath in a quiet river, and they've asked their lovers to come along and watch. This boy makes a thorough examination. If he's satisfied, he must make his intentions clear, in a polite way, of course. He pays her homage by presenting her with a red ribbon, a token of engagement. In receiving it, she accepts his proposal. Romance is truly international. Another festival is called Eating Maiden's Rice. Besides the usual singing and dancing during the day, the whole family has dinner together. A song of toast is sung, and wine flows freely, as the family enjoy the special feast that's been prepared, whose main dish is this colorful rice. At dusk, young boys arrive blowing a horn as a call to their girlfriends. Each girl takes a rice ball to her lover, it's called asking for rice. The rice balls have messages. Pine needles inside the rice ball means that the girl would like needles and thread as a present. Corn means the girl would like an umbrella. Two sticks bound together mean they'll never part. True love. If it's empty, it's bad luck. It means she's breaking it off. Meows will select their mate within the tribe. Two young persons meet on the road. They sing to each other to show their admiration. During the song, they find out about their respective backgrounds and see if the other is knowledgeable. It ends with a real heart-to-heart -heart talk, and the relationship becomes closer as a result. It is customary in this tribe for lovers to carve a notch on a piece of bamboo after each date. If, after numerous dates, they fall in love, they break the bamboo, and each keeps one half as a token of their eternal love. If either one of them ever breaks their vow, they will be obliged to eat the bamboo as a punishment for being unfaithful. Quite an effective deterrent.
The Gurja are a branch of the Miao tribe. They're experts at blowing the sheng, a long horn-like instrument. Under traditional rules, no blowing is allowed after the planting season. Otherwise, the seedlings won't grow. The correct time for sheng blowing is before planting, which is also the right time to look for a girlfriend. Slowly, the girls dance around the boys. Each girl holds a necklace in her hand. As they dance, the girls choose. They put their necklace on their favorite boy's shame. This is called asking for necklaces. This young man is lucky. His shang has been decorated. But not every boy is sure to be successful. This one has something the others don't. He has three necklaces on his shang. The dancing courtship over, they go off in search of other entertainment. Leaving the unfortunate boy to curse his bad luck. The green trousered Yao of Guizhou have a completely different way of courting. Girls all have a small hole in the wall over their beds. It's called a lover's hole. At night, when the girl is asleep, a young boy tries to wake her up by prodding her with a thin bamboo stick. The girl wakes up and grabs the stick. but she doesn't react favorably. So the boy decides to go home. Another one soon arrives. He repeats the same procedure. This time, things look more hopeful. She asks him who he is. They talk to each other through the hole, usually until dawn. He seems like a nice boy, and she lets him in so that he doesn't catch cold. In every Miao village, there is a special place where young people can meet to date or just to talk. Normally, they date in the evenings, but when they're not too busy farming, they also meet during the day. Most girls spend hours and hours embroidering. Those who can't embroider find it very difficult to marry. Free love is popular with the Miao, but marriage is still decided by the parents. The bride must walk to her husband's house. The whole party dresses up to show off their beautifully embroidered costumes, and it's often difficult to tell the bride from the bridesmaids. The Miao never marry within their clan, and 
and these two families live far apart. So the bride's party has a long way to walk. Mia have special greeting customs when a marriage is about to take place. The villagers wait at the entrance to the husband's village and make the bridal party drink from an ox horn. The drinker must be careful not to touch the horn with their hands. Otherwise, they have to drink it down in one gulp. The bride is required to step inside with her left foot forward. This will ensure that her firstborn will be a boy. The wedding is very simple, with no real ceremony. The bride must carry water for her husband's family. At night, she must stay alone in the kitchen. The groom must also find somewhere separate to sleep until the bride is returned to her parents' house. The next day, the bride leaves and goes back to her parents' house. There she continues her work, embroidering, singing love songs, and having affairs with young boys. The couple practice a non-vera local residence. Only in the busy farming season or during festivals will the bride go back to her husband's house for a few days. After she's given birth to a baby, she will start living with her husband. Another form of marriage is the secret marriage. This young couple haven't got their parents' consent, so the boy sends a group of his friends to collect the bride secretly. The bride is ready and packed. She goes off to a quiet place with her bridesmaids, where the wedding is to be held in secret. Quickly, she dons her bridal dress. Some food has been prepared for the wedding breakfast. The event turns into a wedding and a picnic rolled into one. She follows the groom's assistance to her husband. The wedding is now completed. This kind of marriage is recognized as being legal, and the parents cannot object. The Uyghurs of Xinjiang are Muslim. On their holy days, they worship God and take part in extended prayers. Only men are allowed inside the mosque. Women are strictly forbidden. Islam respects patriarchy and a husband's rights over his wife. Women are regarded as subordinate in all matters. Previously, they were obliged to wear a veil when outside the house. If they didn't, the punishment was severe. If a husband says, I release you, he is considered divorced from his wife, and there is nothing that she can do about it. Islam allows polygamy. Their holy book, the Quran, says that a Muslim may marry the woman he loves and have two, three, or even four wives. An old-fashioned Uyghur marriage is very futile in its traditions and is conducted according to Islamic law. The groom's father brings gifts to the bride's house the day before the wedding. 
the gifts include a cow. Understandably, he receives a warm welcome. Men and women are not allowed to mix unless they are kin. So the hosts are all men. gets up early to dress. The wedding dress is a gift from the groom to show that she belongs to him. She will have to obey him in every way from now on. Friends and family come over to celebrate with her. She goes outside to greet the female relatives. Wedding banquet is lavish. An array of snacks, preserves, sweets, and fresh fruit is prepared. All specialties of Xinjiang region. Unlike many other peoples, the Uyghurs hold their weddings at the bride's house. The guests eat whilst waiting for the groom. Finally, he arrives amid much good-natured horseplay. A Muslim holy man conducts the ceremony. First come the prayers. Then the bride takes her vows and says, I do. Then it's the turn of the bridegroom. Of course, he has no hesitation. After the vows, the bride and bridegroom share a piece of salted bread. This symbolizes the hardships they will share during their married life. The wedding party then travels back to the groom's house. Here the bride must be carried over a fire before going inside to prevent evil and bad luck from entering, just as the Han brides do. Dancing and singing continues in celebration of the happy event. The groom's sister takes the bride's veil and the wedding is complete. Freedom, monogamy, and sexual equality are the characteristics of a modern marriage. The marriage laws stipulate that prescribed marriage, purchasing, and any acts interfering with marriage are forbidden. Both partners must marry voluntarily, with no pressure from third parties. Of course, love plays a very important part in any modern marriage and having a love affair is seen nowadays as a prelude to getting married. In the countryside around Beijing, this can be seen happening wherever you look. But not everybody enjoys these romantic encounters. Some people find it difficult to find a partner. This is especially true in big cities. In Beijing, the worker syndicate has set up a lonely hearts club with a computerized dating facility. This modern equivalent of the matchmaker tries to bring together those despairing bachelors with the mates they desire. The scheme has been very successful. The registration and procedures are quite simple. 
personal particulars are noted, and of course, individual requirements. Then it's up to the computer to search its files for a suitable match. When one is found, a meeting between the two people can be arranged. First impressions are very important. A little chat helps to break the ice and get to know one another. If all goes well, the relationship will blossom. This couple seems to be getting along quite well. But some are too anxious to wait. They put up advertisements in the hope that prospective girlfriends will read them. Near the club, there's a love corner where young hopefuls gather with the sole purpose of finding a boyfriend or girlfriend. This sounds quite reasonable. But how do you go about finding Mr. or Miss Wright? Firstly, it must be someone you like. You must go right ahead and get straight to the point. Oh dear, never mind, try again. This looks like another no. Ah, uh, this looks more hopeful. The club provides an excellent service by allowing young men and women to meet and to get to know each other better. Balls are held frequently. It's golden autumn night, the eve of the mid-autumn festival. These two young ladies are obliged to dance together. They obviously haven't found their Prince Charming yet. It seems her luck is in. She's found a handsome man. The ball is divided into sections. This section here is the pro-secondary section for intellectuals. There doesn't seem to be too much happening here. This is the senior citizen section. It's pretty crowded with older men and women trying to find their perfect partners. Finding Mr. or Miss Wright is not very easy. So the staff does what it can to help. Who knows, success could be just around the corner. Throughout the hall, Men and women of every age group are getting together with the opposite sex, trying to select the partner they would like to date. Finally, the ball comes to an end. Partners take their time to say goodbye and exchange addresses 
to arrange further meetings. Some, however, are not so lucky. Soon after the Mid-Autumn Festival, the club holds a spectacular group wedding for 100 couples who have found their match. of ceremonies is the deputy mayor of Beijing. It's quite a grand affair, a happy occasion for all. The couples thank the dating service for their hard work. Then they bow to one another three times. Hopefully, all love stories will have such a happy ending. The harmonious union of love and marriage is the result of thousands of years of evolution. Some people believe that our present system will continue. Others maintain that marriage customs, like many other aspects of everyday life, are in a constant flux and are bound to evolve further. Of course, nothing is absolutely certain. What will the future bring? Judging by the past, your guess is as good as ours.